Hi again, everybody. Back uh, this time for Unit 20 on Imperialism. And a couple of things that we're going to focus on in this unit is we want to take a look at where does this new era of empire building in Africa and Asia in the 19th and 20th century come from. We want to focus on why it's different than previous examples of empire building, because empire building is, is nothing new to this class. I mean, we've been talking about the building of empires since Persia and Rome and Egypt and Mesopotamia. Um, we also want to directly compare it to European empire building in the 16th century and 17th century in the Americas. And then finally, we're going to take a look at some of the effects of imperialism on the colonized people of Africa and Asia as well. So in the recommended supplemental viewing, of course, you have Crash Course. Number 34 deals directly with imperialism. Number 35 deals uh, more with the nationalism and the nationalistic motivations for imperialism by focusing on Japan and Japan's response to imperialism. Uh, the Khan Academy video is uh, is pretty helpful because it ties imperialism more into the process of industrialization and how those two things drove one another, how industrialization cr created demands for markets and raw materials and fuel, and imperialism provided those. At the same time, imperialism was made possible because of the mechanization of warfare that industrialization provided. Um, the videos from AP Euro bit by bit, the causes of imperialism, the effects of imperialism, um, those are going to be similar to what we cover. They're just probably going to go a, a, a bit more in detail. Um, a really good one to watch is going to be the AP Euro bit by bit on social Darwinism, because that's going to go into real heavy detail. It's going to talk about Darwin, his impact on the scientific world, um, how his scientific, you know, how his theory of evolution becomes a pit, becomes a part of kind of popular culture as well. And then how his ideas about animal evolution and natural selection are misapplied to human societies and how it develops into this kind of racist justification for imperialism that we call social Darwinism. So first, let's talk causes, right? Um, Imperialism has a number of different causes. Uh, industrialization is one of them, like I said on the previous slide. Um, the rapid spread of industrialization creates new demands for industrializing states. They need land for their growing populations. They need raw materials to supply their factories. They need new markets and new customers in order to be able to continue to sell these manufactured goods, which are now being produced at greater and greater rates as industrialization uh, continues. And the Atlantic revolutions of the 18th century deprive European states, especially in Western Europe, France, Great Britain, et cetera, um, of this cheap and easy source of labor, raw materials, and markets. Um, after the Atlantic revolutions, the states of Western Europe now have to deal with these newly formed independent states in the Americas, if not on an even basis, on a much more level playing field. They cannot, they can no longer enforce their mercantilist trade policies the way that they had in the previous centuries, right? So what makes uh, imperialism possible? First and foremost is the overwhelming military and technological advantages that industrialized states have over non-industrialized states. Now, the mechanization of warfare is a big part of this, and when we get to World War I, we'll get into it in more detail. But by this point, the mechanization of warfare has advanced very rapidly. In the early 1880s, you see the introduction of the first you know, widespread machine gun known as the Maxim gun, invented by the British. Um, I believe that Germans invent landmines in the 1870s. Uh, you also see the beginning of mortars and um, what, we be, what we know as artillery starts to develop in the late 1800s. But even beyond that, 
you have technological advances in the fields of transportation and the fields of medicine that enable Europeans to begin to penetrate Africa and Asia like they've never been able to do in the past. Uh, you have mass production of antibiotics, you have mass production of vaccines like quinine that protect Europeans from tropical diseases that had stymied their efforts to advance into Africa and Southeast Asia for centuries. Uh, you also have the development of the steam engine, railroad, steam ships, um, which allow for longer, faster, easier transportation. Um, you also have, uh, in the very late 1800s, the invention of the um, in, internal combustion engine, which allows for smaller vehicles like cars and trucks. So the technological advantage that these industrialized states have over non-industrialized states in Africa and in Asia is pretty significant by the last half of the 19th century. It's something that even the greatest states in Asia, like China, like the Mughal Empire, cannot possibly hope to overcome you know, in a long-term conflict. Now, like we said already, industrialization also creates a constant demand in industrialized states, a constant demand for new sources of fuel, like crude oil for gasoline, coal for steam engines. Uh, there's also demand for raw materials, and these demands begin to change as industrialization spreads and diffuses. Um, whereas in the early years of industrialization, coal and iron were the main raw materials and cotton for the textile industry. As industrialization expands, as consumer goods and consumer markets get more varied, um, new raw materials become, you know, become the it product that everyone's searching for. Things like rubber for car tires and insulation um, 